Hello, I'm Jeff Baker, and welcome to the first week of the History of Medicine module for Physicians, Patients, and Society. And this first lecture is entitled Hippocrates. And in this talk, I want to basically ask two questions. The first is, why is Hippocrates considered the father of medicine, even by, by all kinds of doctors? Not only by practitioner, by academic practitioners, by also, but also by alternative uh, healers and, and naturopaths, pathic doctors of all sorts. Secondly, I want to ask, what are the most important legacies of, Hipp of Hippocratic medicine? Why did this style of medicine last as long as it did, and how does it matter today? Well, starting with Hippocrates, it's pretty easy to answer how much we know about Hippocrates because we know very little. We do know that he was a that he lived sometime between the years 460 BC to 370 BC. Uh, we know that he was a doctor who lived in practice on the Isle of Kos, which is just off modern-day Turkey. We know that he trained a lot of pupils. And the, most of all, we know that these pupils wrote books. In fact, there's a library that still exists of over 60 volumes that have been written in Hippocrates' name. So we can say much more about the, what's called the Hippocratic Corpus, the, the, book of, the, work, the, the works written in Hippocrates' names, name than we can say about Hippocrates himself. And I want to make really three generalizations about Hippocratic medicine. The first is that it was naturalistic. Hippocratic medicine, Hippocratic doctors described illness in terms of natural causes. Remember that in earlier cultures, illness and disease was generally attributed to spirits or demons. Uh, it might well be the priest or the shaman who would be the person you would go to to treat an illness. Uh, <clears throat> Hippocratic doctors were different. And one of the most famous Hippocratic writings is one called the Sacred Disease, which is about epilepsy. Epilepsy, of all the diseases that have, uh, that have afflicted humanity, epilepsy in particular has often excited fears uh, that somehow the supernatural is involved. It is a terrifying thing to watch a fellow human being fall down, lose consciousness, succumb to convulsions, um, drooling, is looking completely out of control of their functions. And to people throughout most of, of, of history, it seems pretty clear that epilepsy must involve some kind of spirit taking over a person. Well, the author of The Sacred Disease begged to differ. And he, he, he wrote of, of epilepsy that it appears to me no wise more divine, no more sacred than other diseases but it has a natural cause from which it originates like other aff afflictions. Now to be sure, the natural cause that's proposed in this treatise doesn't really make much sense to us today. He had no idea about epileptiform discharges. Instead, the Hippocratic doctor writing this treatise explained seizures in terms of cold air that would circulate, surround the head, causing cold phlegm to build up. The phlegm would cause a blockage of the body's humors or, or natural fluids and that blockage would lead to the actual seizure. So it's not scientific, it, it's not a scientific explanation in terms of anticipating what we believe today, but it is scientific in the sense that it does not rely on the supernatural or on spirits. It is a naturalistic explanation. The, <clears throat> the kind of theory that's used here is an example of the broader model of Hippocratic medicine, which is sometimes referred to as humoral medicine, because the Hippocratic doctors envisioned all illness in terms of a state of balance or imbalance among four f fluids that pervaded the, the body. When you think about it, um, some of the most striking features of illness are, are basically flows of fluid. You know, people, when you get, people get sick, they may vomit, or they may have loose stools, or they may have discharge come out of their nose. Those are striking phenomena. Um, Hot and cold are also striking phenomena. People may get fevers, or they may have chills, seem very cold. Um, these kind of observations underlay the, the humoral model of medicine, which conceived of the body as always um, in a state of balance. That balance involved four fluids, which are called the four humors, and they are characterized, let's try to get my pointer, as, <clears throat> as corresponding to the four elements. They might be phlegm, um, which is fluid kind of like uh, mucus from the nose, blood, 
um, cholerate fluid, which is, which is bile, and finally black bile. Um, these fluids should be in balance, but in certain conditions, they can be thrown into a different state. For example, in cold and wet weather, you get a buildup of phlegm, and that's why in the winter, you get colds and pneumonias. During the summer, when the air is hot and dry, that causes bile to build up. And bile then can lead to too much heat in the body, which can cause fevers. Malaria often causes fevers in the summer in the areas where Hippocrates practice. This model could be refined in all kinds of ways. And the Hippocratic doctors also recognized that people had different abilities to, that some people um, were more easily thrown out of balance than others. They were recognized as having a strong or weak constitution. Some people seem to have more of one humor than another. Um, they might uh, be have more blood or more bile. All of these factors could be fa could be put together to explain why, at a particular moment of time, a given patient would become sick. <clears throat> so, Hippocratic medicine is characterized by not only by naturalism but by holism, but by seeing the body as an integrated whole. Um, doctors today are often criticized for thinking of people in, for treating diseases rather than treating people. The Hippocratic doctors had no such problem. They, they did, tended not to put work into distinguishing diseases. Rather, they described, you could say that they thought of all illness as, as just variations of one kind of illness, variations of imbalance. Or you might say there as many diseases as there were patients. Um, the Hippocratic doctor's task was to sit down with a patient, listen to their story, listen to the progression of their illness, pay a lot of attention to the patient's fluids, to vomiting and how other fluids might be moving about as clues to what was happening to this internal state of balance. And then, through listening, describe to the patient how their fluids have been thrown out of balance and describe a way to restore that harmony. Uh, we don't think of this as working in any kind of literal way, but it probably was quite powerful if the patient believed in the same theoretical system as well. It likely relied on a kind of mind-body medicine. <clears throat> After the physician listened to the patient and explained the situation, the doctor would then not so much come up with a diagnosis, again, they didn't diagnose diseases, but the doctor would come up with a prognosis. He would describe to the patient um, he would, uh, what was wrong and whether or not the, the state of balance could be restored again. Some conditions were beyond treatment. I'll come back to that in a minute. But if the illness was considered treatable, the doctor would prescribe various interventions to restore balance. Um, these tended, to, most of all, to rely on, on diet. Hippocratic medicine was actually pretty gentle. It involved a lot of cereals and meals and soups and herbs that might promote being hotter or cooler, shift the balance of humors. Um, there were a variety of herbs and drug and botanical remedies that might be used. The more aggressive means of manipulating the humors, such as bloodletting, purging, which is causing vomiting or inducing uh, loose stools, those had a secondary rule, uh, role in Hippocratic medicine. They became more important later on. Hippocratic medicine overall was pretty gentle. And that leads me to the third characteristic of Hippocratic medicine, which I'll call humility. And this is another pretty famous quotation from a Hippocratic treatise called The Art. And here the Hippocratic writer says, medicine's purpose is that it removes the suffering of the sick, it lessens the violence of their diseases, and it does not attempt to cure those who are mastered by their diseases, realizing that in such cases, medicine is powerless. The Hippocratic doctors had a great sense of the limits of medicine, of the, of the limits of their ability. Uh, there was a practical dimension to this. If you're a Hippocratic doctor, you didn't want to, to fail. You, uh, you, didn't, you wanted to preserve your reputation. But there was another dimension to it as well. Um, Greeks were, the Greeks were very concerned about this, which you might call the sin or flaw of hubris. Um, this is Asclepius, who is the patron saint, if you will, of, of Hippocratic healers. He was a demigod, uh, and uh, the story is that he, oh, the, the, the part of the story that matters most for us is that he was a demigod, half god and half man, 
who had a great reputation as a healer, but then he went too far. He tried one day to bring back a person from the dead. That was something that only the gods should be doing. And when Zeus saw that he had tried this, the story is that Zeus picked up one of his thunderbolts and hurled them at Asclepius and struck him, struck him down. Asclepius went up into the sky where he remains placed among the constellations today. The story of Asclepius would remind a Greek doctor of the dangers of hubris, of the dangers of trying to be more confident than the art really allows. Hippocratic doctors generally thought of their role as being one of assisting nature, not of controlling nature. The theme of humility leads us more into Hippocratic ethics, uh, which are embodied in the, one of the most famous documents in the history of medicine, the Hippocratic Oath. This is actually written a century after the historical Hippocrates. Um, it became a very important statement. Uh, it's too important to summarize here. I'm going to give you a separate exercise on this that will, that will give you a chance to look at the oath, which is pretty short, and it's, and it's actually kind of fun to read. So we'll come back to that. For now, I just want to close by summarizing the three most important legacies of Hippocratic medicine. The first is that it was naturalistic. Hippocratic doctors, although their theories may not make much sense to us today, they anticipated science in the sense that they did not appeal to the supernatural. The second is, is holism. Hippocratic doctors, although they relied on a theory that, again, we don't share, had a vision of, a vision of medicine, of the body, that emphasized the whole person. Um, it was not about reducing people to individual diseases or to organs. Um, in that sense, Hippocratic medicine anticipated primary care and a lot of integrative medicine today. And the final aspect of Hippocratic medicine that we've emphasized is its humility, the metaphor of assisting rather than controlling nature. Uh, these factors created a powerful model of medicine, a model of medicine, incidentally, that's quite analogous to forms of medicine found in ancient China and India. And we'll see that in, in, in Europe and the Mideast and Africa, this model of medicine would last for virtually 2,000 years. That's what we're gonna look at in our next talk. I'll look forward to seeing you then.